We take so much for granted these days when it comes to video games, including game saves. Game consoles usually come with a ton of storage to manage your save data, and even better, offer cloud storage so you can easily transfer save game data between hardware systems with relative ease. But back in the day, things weren't as simple. Depending on the hardware, saving a game had its challenges, and different game systems used different approaches to saving. Generally speaking, in all computing, there must be a way to allow a user to save data and to retrieve that data at a later stage. But accessing this data required different formats, and those formats varied over the years, with some very crude methods to some quite sophisticated ones. Let's take a look. Now back in the day, when I owned a Commodore 64, I only had a tape drive. Disk drives were an expensive luxury. Depending on where you lived in the world, a C64 disk drive could cost more than the computer itself. So most of us use tape. The earliest game I ever remember playing that required saving was The Bard's Tale by Electronic Arts. This game was a classic early RPG where you could form a party of up to six characters. Each character could be saved individually to cassette or you could save a party which grouped the entire party in a single save. You could only ever save in taverns and guilds in the game which removed much of the complexity of the save system. However, in order to progress, you would need to provide a blank cassette to save your game. This meant that you would need to know the exact position on cassette to where the data was stored. If it wasn't at the beginning of the tape, you would need to label it as to where it was, usually by using the tape counter as the guide. The manual even warned you, do not repeatedly save over the top of your old parties, as if you make a mistake, you will have saved over your hard work. Saving games to cassette is certainly something that I would never want to revisit ever again. And later on, I upgraded to a disk drive. This was much more like it. Of course, this was the much preferred choice over tapes. The disk drive would automatically seek the data for you. But it's important to understand that in order to save your game to floppy disk, that you would have to provide a blank floppy disk outside of the game itself to store your save games on. And you couldn't normally have one general purpose disk to manage different saves across games like you do with memory cards. It would normally require a specific formatted disk with a specific label to copy the game save data on. Back in the day, this is one of the reasons why us nerds in school carried around a box of floppy disks in our backpacks. The second of course was piracy, but hey, let's move on. On the PC, things were a little bit more relaxed and by the time hard drives became standard, managing save games was even easier. Now I did say that almost all home computers required blank disks for saves, but this wasn't true for game consoles. The Nintendo Famicom Disk System, which released exclusively in Japan, used floppy disk media for its games, and it would often save its user game data on the very same disk as the game itself. The system uses proprietary floppy disks known as disk cards, which was effectively affordable data storage that could manage a user's save game data on. Now while you could argue that writing data onto the same original media as the game itself is a bad idea, the concept is often considered as enabling technology for what was to come. Nintendo would move to the cartridge format for their NES, and in North America they would look to bring some of their games from the Famicom Disk System to their new hardware. However, with the cartridge format, this introduced some new complexities for saving games but there would be a solution known as SRAM, short for Static Random Access Memory. In its simplest term, SRAM is a group of circuits that have two stable states that can store state information, and this data will remain in a stable state as long as power is supplied. To access the data, a line is activated to allow the processor to either read or write these bits to the SRAM data, and the RAM is volatile that requires constant power to retain data. Without it, contents vanish almost immediately in a matter of milliseconds. To enable saves, cartridges will pair an SRAM circuit with a coin cell battery, which provides backup power when the console is off. This setup is fast for read and writes. It also has unlimited write cycles. However, the biggest problem is the standard battery life of a coin cell battery lasts around 10 to 20 years before draining completely. This of course has the side effect of corrupting saves forever. In the early days of the NES, SRAM circuitry was not cheap, and often games would resort to a password system instead. Titles with onboard SRAM saves, usually RPGs, would cost more to manufacture, in general around 10-20% to increase on production costs. By the launch of the Game Boy, SRAM was quite cheap, 
and was used in many Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. But interestingly, other hardware makers at the time would come up with their own strategies. When NEC launched the Turbo Graphics known as the PC Engine in North America, the proprietary format for games was on Hue cards. These were storage mediums that looked like a credit card and there was simply no room on the card for a battery and no way to save games. So many of the games on the PC Engine resorted to using a password system. Later models, including the Turbo CD and Turbo Duo, would allow for saving games, but since most Hue card games didn't support them anyway, they had to consider the lowest common denominator that most people were using the stock PC Engine or Turbo Graphics hardware. And in turn, the majority of games had simply no way of saving data. The Super Nintendo was predominantly a combination of both SRAM based saves and password based games. SRAM was common as the cost had now become more affordable. It also had become an interesting copy protection measure. During this time, disk copiers were becoming quite common. These were effectively man in the middle piracy devices that effectively would allow the contents of a cartridge to be dumped onto floppy disk. And most disk copiers would come with the maximum amount of SRAM that was available for the time to ensure maximum compatibility across the entire library. As a result, as an anti-piracy measure, some games would check for the presence of SRAM even if the game didn't support it and knew that a copier was connected if it was detected and it would lock out the user with an anti-piracy screen. On the other hand, the Nintendo 64 offered developers the freedom to manage save game data in a number of different ways. And this was both a blessing and a curse for the hardware. There exists 12 games that have SRAM coin cell battery save circuits on the cartridge as shown here. Just like before, the game data will be erased as soon as the battery dies. However, the N64 would introduce a new EEPROM save system to over 100 games on the hardware. EEPROM, short for Electronic Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory, is non-volatile memory that is also used to store save game data. The EEPROM chip was soldered directly onto the cartridge PCB and connected to the N64's bus interface via serial. Write speeds would be significantly slower on EEPROM saves, but this would be offset by the reduced size of the EEPROM chips themselves. There exists a theoretical number of writes that can be performed. Approximately 100,000 writes can be made as compared to the unlimited number for SRAM saves. EEPROMs were used for smaller saves while SRAM usually contained larger save data on the N64. To add to the complexity, there were many games, mainly third-party efforts that supported saves but did not come with any EEPROM or SRAM hardware to manage the save data on the cartridge. Notable games would include the Turok series, the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series, San Francisco Rush and Mystical Ninja. This approach was done in order to keep manufacturing costs down, but instead would require data to be saved to the Nintendo 64 controller pack, an optional memory card that has 32 kilobytes of SRAM storage. The addition of memory packs to controllers would be something that would be used on the Sega Dreamcast and original Xbox. Other games, including Diddy Kong Racing, would use the controller pack to save ghost data, but maintained EEPROM saves on the cartridge itself most third-party games would use the controller pack save method because the controller pack is SRAM. Within about 20 to 25 years, their batteries will have to be replaced. Finally, there was even a third method of saving games known as flash saves. This was a one megabit larger non-volatile memory chip that was used in some games for saving progress. And unlike SRAM, flash RAM does not lose its data when the power is removed. Flash RAM was used in a handful of titles, including The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Jet Force Gemini, Pokemon Snap, and the Stadium games. It's worth noting that modern flash carts like the EverDrive and Summer Kart 64 uses flash memory to store entire game libraries. Although the terms are very similar, the technology is quite different. And if you thought this was complex, the Nintendo Game Boy Advance had four different types of saves, including SRAM, FRAM, which was functionally identical to SRAM, but didn't require power to keep the save, as well as the EEPROM saves with no battery and a smaller save file. This was used in games such as Super Mario Advance, and later, Flash RAM would be introduced into games like Pokemon with medium to long save times, no battery, and large save files. In general, Cartridge-based hardware moved away from SRAM in favor of flash RAM as costs reduced. 
but CD-based game consoles emerged and hardware makers had to think of new ways to save data. On the cartridge, the problem was solvable by adding SRAM, EEPROM or flash RAM chips on board. And of course, you wouldn't get that luxury on CD-based systems. On the Sega Saturn, it contains BRAM, which is effectively a battery backup SRAM for saves. It was powered by a user-replaceable CR2032 coin cell that also managed the real-time clock. The SRAM chip on the Saturn drains power much faster than the Nintendo 64 and requires the battery to be replaced every two to three years. However, Sega would also introduce an official flash storage backup cartridge that would detect and prioritize saves. The Amiga CD32 was another early CD-based console, and it saves games to its 1 kilobytes of internal non-volatile NVRAM. When the game is saved, it's stored in NVRAM, which can also be accessed by a boot screen menu, which can then be used to lock and unlock saves. By locking a save, it prevents it from being overwritten if the NVRAM space runs out. But it would ultimately be Sony that would revolutionize the concept by introducing removable flash memory cards that could be used to store saved data for many games on a single card for their PlayStation 1 hardware. PS1 memory cards are non-volatile flash memory formatted with a proprietary structure. It also contains icon and data information with an animated 3D icon for up to three frames, including audio snippets and the game data itself. A memory card save manager is viewable in the PS1 and PS2 BIOS for copying and deleting. These memory cards were plugged directly into the console slots themselves with no batteries required. The PlayStation 2 memory card, known as the Magic Gate Flash, was a larger 8 megabyte in size. These would not only support PlayStation 2 saves, but also PS1 saves via backward compatibility. The Magic Gate system prevented unlicensed copies and bootloaders on non-Magic Gate cards, and it had additional support for 3D animated icons, audio snippets, and additional game data. These flash memory cards would be used in most game consoles, including the Nintendo GameCube, Sega Dreamcast, original Xbox, Xbox 360, as well as the Sony PlayStation Vita and PSP, with later hardware supporting SD and USB flash storage for their saved data. The original Xbox was the first hardware that allowed for save game data built into the hard drive storage directly, something that is still very much used to this day. So if you think that managing save game data is a pain to deal with in 2025, back in the day it was far more tedious. Most of the time, you had no control over it, the formats were different, and there was always that risk of losing data. Having a game console with large storage to manage your entire library of save games and allow you to move them between consoles, either via USB or cloud storage, is far more convenient than it ever was. And that is a good thing. But we're going to leave it here for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and we will catch you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.